Ah, uh, geek out. Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm good. And this week we have an interview with Jay Ferber. His book, uh, Elsewhere, um, debuts on Wednesday, August 2nd with uh, uh, Sumie uh, Keskin on art. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Jay's work outside of Elsewhere, he's also doing the Image comic series Copperhead. And he's a, uh, he's a staff writer or sh- uh, on the uh, CBS show Zoo. But hey, let's let him talk about literally all of that because he's a good hang. And joining us this week, we have Jay Ferber. His uh, new image comic series, Elsewhere, with art by Sumie Keskin, debuts on Wednesday, August 2nd, in comic book shops everywhere and on Comixology, if you're more digitally inclined. Jay, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. So, Elsewhere is kind of this this kind of fantasy, revolutionary world, and you've got Amelia Earhart, which, you know, at the week we're recording this, is a big news week yeah. out of nowhere yeah. for Amelia That's Earhart. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, some marketing synergy I was able to create. <laughs> what what made you want to kind of combine? Because, you know, we've seen the revolutionary fantasy space with science fiction world before. What made sure. you want to throw in some uh, classic, you know, aviator in there? Uh, I really, I wanted the book to have a grounded, uh, some, some sort of point of view with, with a, a relatable character. And, uh, and, and a, a human character, I think, is, is the best way to ground this kind of fantasy story. And then I some I, I don't know I, I can't pinpoint the moment, but something occurred to me that wouldn't it be cool if this is where Amelia Earhart ended up and that she was our character. I, I, I don't know exactly what sparked that idea, but it uh I just ran with it and, and thought it would be a cool hook into the story. Uh uh and again because she's uh a, a known commodity, you know, you could you could sell the the concept more easily if you say Amelia Earhart rather than some new generic character I created. Uh, and it automatically brings story potential to it. You know, it's kind of built in already. What, what, what is kind of the, uh, I mean, I guess this is a question for the, to be answered for the larger series, but elsewhere itself is kind of this realm, this nexus where time and space kind of have no meaning. I, a la Stephen King's dark tower or the nexus from, uh, I guess, Star Trek generations. Um, it's the only other. Yeah, a, a little bit. It's it, it is a it is a all we know for sure is that it's not on Earth. Is it is a it's a place uh, that is not on Earth. Whether it's another planet or another dimension, it, it seems to exist in a different time period. Uh, but but that is something we that you know we'll, we'll get into more as the series progresses. Uh, but it, but as you said, it is something that that we'll have to explore as we go. I don't want to say too much about it. Uh, you know, the, the most important part is that it's just it's not Earth. It's a completely new world and environment with totally different uh, you know, races of, of people and creatures and, and, you know, kind of magic. And, and it's just Amelia is completely out of her element. Uh, again, without, you know, necessarily giving the game away, what can you say about the, the political climate? Because with this first issue, you literally hit the ground running. Yeah, she, she does. She gets thrown into a... a she she meets up with with this kind of band of rebels who who appear to be under the thumb of this uh, ruler named Lord Cragen, and uh, she ends up having to make a decision. You know, does she want to throw her lot in with these folks? Uh, and it's just you know we'll learn more about this this uh, this conflict between uh, you know kind of the ruler of, of this kingdom and the rebels who are trying to overthrow him and and get their their land back uh, as as we go but but she does kind of become a a, a valued member of this rebellion uh, and is on her way to becoming kind of a freedom fighter in her own right uh, when really all she wants to do is get home uh, is find her way back to earth kind of a, almost like a wizard of Oz type scenario. A little bit, yeah, totally. It's drafted into this greater That's like, right. crusade. By the way, yeah. Lord uh, Lord Cragen is like the most metal looking character I've ever seen. When I saw him, <laughs> I was like that how much of that was uh was your design and how much of it was the artist because he, he just looks that, like a total badass. <laughs> that was all her. I really? mean she she submitted a few different designs, I think, and we fine tuned it, but it, it all came from her head. I had no uh, <laughs> specificities in mind when I created him. Well, that must uh, have been cool. Him, I that, should say that must have been cool when you got the when you got the the art Groups, back yeah. for that. Cause... Oh yeah, getting her designs was was so 
influential in in this whole process. Uh, she's just amazing. Yeah. You know, now that we're kind of talking about Sumie, this is her first major comic work. What made you want to you know entrust this this story visually into her hands? Yeah, I mean, she's she's done a little bit at Top Cow, uh, but her her artwork and her imagination are just incredible. Yeah. And uh, we had teamed up to to pitch a different book to Image. Uh, it was just kind of a crime book, very grounded. And we pitched it, and Eric Stevenson was like, you know, this is cool, but I feel like it's nothing we haven't seen before. Uh, and so he kind of challenged us to come up with something more distinct. Uh, and I really felt that I wanted to, to see if we can come up with something that would uh, service uh, Sumeye's artwork more than than just kind of a grounded crime book would. Uh, her stuff is so much more imaginative than that. Uh, so we just kind of bounced some ideas around, and this is what we hit on. So it's it, it wasn't a matter of so much of me having this idea and choosing her to draw it. It's something that I, I came up with with her for her kind of a thing. So it's it's very much a collaboration. Now, both Elsewhere and your other Image comic series, um, uh, Copperhead, have very strong, you know, kick-ass female protagonists. What What is it that mm-hmm. kind of draws you to, to write and inspire you to write those kind of characters? Uh, it's it's. I mean, I think it's just a question of, like, why not? Uh, with Copperhead, I honestly don't remember if it was my idea or Scott, the artist's idea, to have our lead be a woman. Uh oh. And then, you know, here with Elsewhere, it was Amelia Earhart. And it's just, uh, um, I, I, I don't want to say, like, that's my niche by any means. I mean, I've written plenty of books with a male protagonist. Uh, uh, and, in fact, I think I've written more than I have with a female protagonist. But at the same time, it just feels like, especially in this day and age, why not do that? There, there's no reason not to. Uh, I just think that, that having a female in the lead... Uh, it, it just gives you an opportunity to subvert some tropes that, that may be a little rusty that, that are new, even just by looking at it through a different gender lens, I think. Um, an- another question I kind of had is, you know, for our listeners at home that aren't in necessarily in the know, you also write and, and produce for, for television, uh, you know, currently yes. for uh, CBS zoo, uh, mm-hmm. which is in the middle of its uh, third season, I believe now. Correct. Yes. What What is kind of the you know how does one kind of inform the other? Be it screen writing for the screen, be it big or small, and then of course writing for for comics. Uh it's I I think it's there. There's a lot of similarities in terms of in in both mediums. You're writing visually. You're you're describing something that will either be drawn or acted and produced, as opposed to writing uh, a novel where it's just you know the the writing is the the end end game. Uh, so it's, it, it helps to think visually in both mediums. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's very different. I mean, television, especially television, even more than film kind of relies on talking heads. Uh, you know, that that's the most budget friendly thing you can do is have two characters in a room talking. And if you have good enough actors, it'll be amazing. Whereas in comic books, that's the kind of thing that I like to try to stay away from just because even with the best artist, two characters in a room talking is not the most dynamic thing you're going to look at on a comic book page. And in a comic, you know, your budget is unlimited. If the artist can envision it, he or she can draw it. Uh, Whereas in television, there's very much budgetary constraints and, you know, we may have the most amazing action sequence in mind, but whether we can pull it off on a TV budget is a, is always a huge question. And, you know, it's always a matter of how close we can get to what we want it to be with the, the limited budget we have. Uh, but it, it's great to be able to work in both. I think they both kind of uh, use slightly different muscles. Uh, they're both very collaborative, but TV is collaborative in a much bigger way in terms of you have an entire production crew that, that's helping to, to bring this story to life. Or as with comic books, it's, you know, three or four people at most uh, are bringing it to life. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, collaborations, both big and small, uh, and both equally fun. Well, you, you had mentioned, so your comic work is more generally more action oriented and certainly with this first issue of elsewhere. And honestly, I mean, Copperhead, I feel like escalates considerably with every single arc. Mm. Um, how would you kind of, and I, I think within that, okay, using Copperhead as an example, that first arc, I think there's a, there's themes of both a fresh start for Clara and her son for Zeke 
and there's the idea of family, which we kind of see juxtaposed with the Cletus family massacre. Um, how, what would you say is the pacing like throughout this first arc of Elseworld or Elsewhere? And what's what? What would you say are some of the themes across this debut arc? Ah, uh, boy, that's a good question. I, I never really. Uh, it, it's funny in terms of themes. I remember Mark Wade, uh, one of my favorite writers, saying this, and I don't know that he came up with it or if he was quoting someone else, but he was saying as a writer, you don't pick your theme, your theme picks you. Uh, And I've always found that to be true in in that I never really sit down to think about like, here's the theme that I'm going to write about. It's just something that sort of is, finds itself in my work uh, kind of after the fact. Um, So with elsewhere, I didn't really have a theme in mind when I sat down to write, but I, I do think the theme is, is of, I guess like perseverance and determination and, you know, uh, just the drive to get home, uh, both for Amelia and for some of these rebels who want to reclaim their home from, from Lord Cragen. Uh, and it's, so it's, it does kind of permeate the the story. Uh, and it does just in terms of scale and scope, it does get bigger and bigger, uh, as, uh, Amelia and, and the rebels kind of come into further conflicts with Craig and, and his men or his troops rather. Uh, and, and those, those conflicts escalate into a bigger and bigger to the first arc. Uh, and then in the series itself, we're going to kind of expand the scope just in terms of fleshing out this world they're in, looking at what's beyond Craig immediate kingdom. What else is in this world are there other races other civilizations uh that is stuff that is kind of a limitless thing for us to explore uh as we go forward and i suppose you know without giving the game away there is you know i you know not to get my nose too brown but i've been known (laughs) to do it from time to time i feel like you've mastered the art of the cliffhanger you see it in just about Every single issue of Copperhead, and again, without giving the game away, this one ends on a pretty big twist if you know your aviation history a bit. Um, <laughs> are we going to kind of see <laughs> no problem? Are we going to kind of <laughs> see that uh, the mystery and the nature of elsewhere kind of explored in addition to this revolution? Yes, we will. Uh, it, it is going to be a bit of a slow burn because I don't want to get it too. It, when you read, when you get to the last page of Elsewhere Number One, and and what that reveal is, which I don't want to spoil, uh, it it's the kind of thing that could lend itself to getting tired very quickly if we do that sort of thing too often. So I I, I want to limit it to a degree, but but Amelia, there are members of this rebellion who have more knowledge about how Amelia got here and how she might return uh, to to Earth than they initially let on. So, so there is a bit of a mystery there that Amelia wants to unravel. And, and so we, we will explore just how trans transportation between our world and, and this, this strange world uh, is possible. And then just, you know, has it happened more than once? Is Amelia the first person? Is she the last? Those are questions that we will definitely tackle in a, in a, in an ongoing way. Now, to, to kind of change gears, over in the Copperhead world, again, that third arc comes out on uh, Wednesday, August 30th in comic book stores. Yeah, the com- trade. Yep. Right, yeah. The, it feels like basically everything that could go wrong for Sheriff Clara Branson happens in this arc. Her relationship with Boo comes to a head. There is probably the biggest, the highest profile murder that Copperhead has ever seen and her past has has you know inescapably caught up with her this time. So, what made you? I mean, because uh, obviously there was kind of like an establishment with the first arc. The second arc, we kind of see a bit more of her relationship with Boo, and you know, with kind of the outlaw element within Copperhead. What made you want to bring just about all these major threads to a head at once in this third arc? Uh, I guess I just wanted to. To escalate things, I mean, I, I felt like it was time to start answering some of the questions about Clara and her past and, and bring that to the forefront in the fourth arc, especially. You'll, you'll really get answers then. Uh, and I, I guess I sort of have an attitude with, with stories these days in, in terms of, like, why wait? Uh, if, if there's a good story I can do now, 
why wait? Why put it off and, and tread water until later? Uh, and all this stuff felt juicy to me, so why not do it? Uh, you know, we'll, I'll never run out of story. There, there's, there's, I can build more, and it's, it's better to you know, kind of pull that trigger and see where it goes uh, to mix my metaphors uh, as opposed to just like, well, let's hold off and, and tell that story in issue 30 instead of doing it now. Uh, it, it just felt like, why not? You know, the readers, I think, uh, would like to see some of the answers about that we've hinted about, about Clara's past. And I was eager to to finally tell that story and, and then just see where it goes once we come out the other side of it, how both the readers and the characters in Copperhead, knowing Clara's past, how that will uh, change the stories uh, ahead. What was some of your, I mean, you know, inspir- this is very much kind of a space western, you know, a town out in the boonies. I think it's a, it's a mining town, at, just like many of those frontier, frontier towns. What, w- what was some of your inspiration in kind of creating this, this wild west in, in space? Uh, the, I think the, the, my, my sort of one sentence pitch to artist uh, Scott Gadleski when I first approached him about it was a, uh, a Western in space. And, and it was kind of Deadwood on Deadwood with aliens, I think is how I pitched it. Uh, and I wanted I'm far from the first person to ever conceive of a, of a space Western. I mean, obviously, we all know Firefly and, and even Star Trek was pitched as wagon train in space Uh and I wanted to, but both those those approaches, both Firefly and and the Star Trek, uh, were the the premise was mobile. It it the the characters moved. They were all on a journey. I wanted Copperhead to be stationary. I wanted to do a version of the Western where you're in a town like like Deadwood or like even Gunsmoke or you know Wyatt Earp or, or whatever, where you're where the town is the story, and and stories come to the town new characters arrive in town and bring story with them. Uh, so that, that was kind of my approach to this thing. So it's, it's all of those. It's, 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 you know, the wide herb stuff, gun smoke. Uh, and then even when I started talking to Scott about it, and this isn't a Western, although thematically it might be a little bit was jaws. Uh, that was Scott's pitch was that, uh, what was, you know, that, that our sheriff should be like Sheriff Brody, uh, which I thought was an interesting, uh, just insight into to how how to how to see this character and that kind of archetype. That means that the sheriff's going up against like the worst mayor of all time. Yeah, <laughs> Jaws yes. mayor. Yes, there's that too. And and his other Scott's other contribution was um, uh, that that he thought that it would be cool if there was like a Jeremiah Johnson type character uh, who turned out to be Ishmael, just a, a, a character living out in the woods outside town. Uh, and and we kind of grafted that onto this idea of there being these artificial humans uh, who were kind of left over after the war. Uh, so we kind of merged those two ideas. You know, this third arc really delves into into Clara's past, and, and you've certainly hinted at at Boo and uh, Boo and Ishmael. Are we going to see more of that going into into the fourth arc? Uh, the fourth arc is is more Clara's story. Uh, it, it really does tell all the the whole story of her backstory. We understand her a lot more. Uh, so that does leave um, Boo and the. Uh, Sorry, I was getting another call. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, still here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I start over? Start that answer over? No, you're, you're good. Yeah. Okay. The uh, Clara's story plays out in the fourth arc, and the uh, I, I think we'll get into Boo's story. I don't know if it'll be the fifth or the sixth, but but there is definitely the untold story of. I, I want to talk more about the war that that happened and Ishmael's role in it, and Boo's role in it, and even Clara's role in it if she had one. Uh, so that is definitely like a separate backstory that we'll get into. Speaking of Copperhead, we have to Sam and I have to we let have you to know give about a shout this. out. We yeah, have... so uh, Sam and I um, we work at the Image Booth. Yeah, so like we oh, cool. uh, we volunteer like San Diego or this upcoming yeah. San Diego. So if you'll be at San Diego, we'll be there. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, I will not, but uh, okay. but I will think fondly of you. <laughs> yeah, but one of the reasons we tell you that is one of our really good friends, Vernon, also happens to work uh, uh, do volunteer work with Image at the at the shows and he i think is probably responsible for like a third of copperhead sales because the the amount of 
Every show we go to, he sells he, out. He single handedly sells out. Copperhead. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> he single handedly sells it out every time. That's not an exaggeration so either. Shout out to oh, Vernon. Yeah, he is. That's uh, thank you, Vernon. That's uh, that's amazing. Yeah, we'd kick ourselves if we didn't at least uh, give you that tidbit because he freaks <laughs> out every con. He's like, we got to sell it out. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! I to, love Vernon. <laughs> to his credit, he does. He, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he does. Excellent. <laughs> It's just and it's the it's the coolest stuff. He's like like oh you like Saga try Copperhead. Yeah, exactly. Oh you like oh, Sex Criminals wow. try Copperhead. Yeah. <laughs> High praise. That's right. Yeah, he's got he's got that pitch down to a science. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so what is it like working? I mean, because for this third arc, and I presume uh, moving forward, obviously Scott's still doing the covers and he's still working yep. as I suppose a visual consultant. But what's it like working with? Uh, how's the dynamic with uh, Drew Moss moving into the these arcs? It's great. It's uh, Drew's awesome. And and I don't consult with Drew as much about the plot as I did with Scott. Uh, Drew is, is a slightly more of a hired gun. Uh, but I mean, he's he's one of the family and, and he's fantastic. I mean, he's just a machine. You know, I'll turn in a he's I'll turn in a plot and he'll have the whole book laid out like just a couple of days later. Uh, and he's off to the races. Uh, and it's, it's great. I mean, I, I think his art is not that different from Scott's in terms of it's, it's not too jarring to, to, you know, to go from, from one to the other. Uh, but it is different enough that he's definitely not doing a, he's not trying to ape Scott or, or to appear to, to change his style to suit Scott's or, or reflect Scott's. Uh, they're very, it's still very much his own stuff, but I think it's complimentary. It's still in the same zip code as, is Scott's approach. So it, it still feels like Copperhead to us. It definitely has a lot of the same uh, visual sensibility. I I kind of had yeah. to like check the covers. I was like, oh, it's somebody else. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, um, when can we expect the uh, the start of of the fourth arc? Uh, let's see. The third trade comes out in late August, and I think we're off in September. So then the next arc will start in October. I believe is how it works. Uh, and yeah, he's already. Uh, we're already Drew is so far ahead. I think he's drawn the first two or three issues of the next arc already. Uh, so we, we've got a lot in the can. The, the book scheduling woes, I think, are a thing of the past. Hopefully, was part of the uh, how did how did Drew kind of come on board for this one? Uh, it was I approached him because we, you know, after much deliberation, finally determined that that Scott. Uh, w- was not going to be able to come back and, and draw the next arc as we had hoped. Uh, so, you know, we got the green light to approach Drew and, or to approach to find somebody who could, who could, you know, kind of fill his shoes. And I think Drew was the first guy that came to mind and uh, uh, we approached him and he was available and it was very kind of quick and easy process. Uh, I, I'm and, and, you know, he has Scott's blessing and, you know, like as you had said earlier, Scott's still very much involved with the book. He does the covers and consults with character designs occasionally, and just story ideas and stuff. What can we expect with the with the fourth arc? I mean, if it's anything like third, I presume it picks up right at the you know after the the previous one, and just kind of again escalates and escalates. Yeah, it 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 does, and it's it's definitely, and there are a lot of flashbacks to uh, Clara's life before Copperhead, so we see kind of what uh, the circumstances that led her to have to come and take this job. Uh, and it's, it, it really, it kind of plays with, with a couple of the different men in her life uh, that we have met before and, a, and one that we have not. Uh, so it, it, and it does just escalate in a big way. There's a lot of action and high stakes. Uh, I, I think it's, it's our best arc yet. It's, uh, we're really happy with it. Nice, nice. Now this is something completely out of left field. But okay. John Carpenter does the theme song, the theme music to Zoo. Have you had? He does. Have you had any experiences with uh, with? Because we're all big John Carpenter oh, yeah. fans. I agree. Yeah, same here. I, unfortunately, I have not. Uh, my bosses, the showrunners, uh, I, I think have met him at least once. Uh, but he only did the theme, and he doesn't do the actual, uh, you know, uh, score each episode or anything. He just did the theme, so it's kind of a a one shot deal. Uh, so I. I I we only interacted with him. Uh, my boss has only interacted with him that that one time when they approached him about doing it. Uh, but we're all. I think that's a a super fun fact that not many people know was that uh, he did our theme song. 
That's pretty sweet. I mean, he did the theme song to one of the most iconic, one of the most iconic horror themes, if not the yeah. most iconic horror theme of all time. Oh, yeah. Totally. And I'm trying to think. It, he, was, he wasn't the one that did The Thing, but he did Big Trouble in Little China, mm-hmm. if I remember, musically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So all these soundtracks, all these synth-driven soundtracks to my childhood. Yep. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> So, it's the, the the one thing that disappoints me is that this season uh, we revised our opening so we don't hear his whole theme. We only hear a tiny snippet of it. Uh, but we had to do that to make room for more story. Yeah. Get those first two seasons, listeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. That's cool. So, Jay, something we ask everybody that comes on the show, what are you currently geeking out over? Boy, what am I geeking out over right now? Right now, uh, if anybody follows me on Twitter, this will come as no surprise to them. But I'm a huge nerd for uh, detective shows from the 70s and 80s. Uh, And The Rockford Files was just released on Blu-ray. So that is what I'm geeking out over right now is uh, revisiting some of my favorite Rockford Files episodes in glorious high definition. (laughs) Would you say you're more uh, Jim Rockford than uh, Magnum P.I.? I'm probably somewhere in the middle between those two. Those are uh, those are my two favorites. So I, I don't know if I had to pick a favorite boy. I, I think I would have a meltdown. It'd be a tough, tough call. Well, I won't. I won't put you through all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and anything else like uh, out in the out in the wide world these days? Ah, uh, boy, what else? Um, nothing I can talk about definitively. Um, I, I've got another. Another comic book project that, that's going to hopefully launch in the fall uh, at, a, at a publisher I had never worked with before. Uh, so so that will be that should be exciting. It's uh, it's it's something new, something I haven't done before with a, a new publisher uh, for me. So that I'll, I'll, I'll be spreading the word when I can on that. Uh, and other than that, it's just elsewhere and Copperhead and, and more Zoo. Oh, sounds good, man. Do you have anything? Uh, I guess we kind of just went over that, but is there anything you'd like to to plug before we, you know, before we while we got you on the show? Ah, uh, boy, uh, I can't think of anything at the moment. But uh, as you said, you know, elsewhere launches on the second. We've got um, uh, a great, you know, uh, Sumaya did the regular cover, and we have Andrew Robinson did a great variant cover for us, and we've got issue two has a. Mahmoud Asrar variant cover and issue th- or wait no issue two is Yildare Sinar issue three is Mahmoud Asrar uh, and uh, issue four I think is going to be Eric Kennedy uh, so we've got some great variant covers coming up uh, as well as as regular covers by our uh, fantastic co-creator uh, Sumaya just a murderer's row of variant covers oh, yeah 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 <laughs> an embarrassment of riches <laughs> well, yeah well, uh, again, that first issue of uh, that first issue of Elsewhere is in comic shops everywhere on Wednesday, uh, August second, or Comicsology if you're more inclined. And that uh, volume three of Copperhead is out in comic book stores everywhere. And again, on Comicsology if you're digitally inclined on Wednesday, August thirtieth. And, and of course, check out Vernon for those first two. <laughs> but, yeah. they're, but they're also, yes. <laughs> I'm sure, like most of the people listening to this, have bought a copy from him. <laughs> If you've gone to a comic show and swung by the image booth, chances are Vernon's yes. tried to sell you a copy. Wow. <laughs> and this chances guy's are, got quite the legend. Yes. <laughs> he's, and he succeeds. Yeah, he does. <laughs> but uh, Jay, <laughs> Jay, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. Like I said, good hang with that Jay Ferber. Thanks again for coming on the show. Yep, yep, yep. Elsewhere mm-hmm. is out in comic book stores everywhere Wednesday, August 2nd. Gentlemen, I think we need to discuss a film. A film. <laughs> A, a particular film. I, what did I just say? <laughs> I don't know, but leave it in. <laughs> a <laughs> particular oh. film. We're leaving it. Yeah, that mic was always sensitive. Anyway. It's true. The uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. I saw that movie. Ah, mm. oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you there? Were you there? You were there. I wasn't there. For Ken and I saw it together. Did you guys see it together? Yeah. Aw, yeah. that's cute. So we went in two separate groups. That's cute. Aww. Yeah, because we haven't been to the Alamo in, since yeah. Rogue One. For me, anyway. I haven't Blech. seen a movie at that theater in a long <laughs> that, that time. Yeah, that might be true. Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Really? Gotta remember. Yes. Well, Ken and I, Ken and I <laughs> went to matter. the Alamo. To see Spider-Man: Homecoming, uh, the Thursday night premiere show. Uh, Ken, mm-hmm. uh, true to his nerd fashion, 
Uh, was fashion, dressed up. Is that what it's yeah, called? Yeah, yeah. Was dressed <laughs> up. Case. Yeah, literally. <laughs> was dressed up I- as Spider Man. Exactly. With his neat uh, web backpack. Yes. Which, no. I, I'm which really I'm a fan of. Classic. I love the web backpack. I really like it. Like it's well, like they people can buy it for like you know twenty bucks, but like this guy was selling for seventy five, and, and it like looks. It's an like it. It's substantial. Like there's actual. There's like a actual thicker cord. spider webs. Yeah, actually, <laughs> made by amiss, actual spiders. I miss yeah. the hot glue actual and like spider. twine and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and I really, I really do like it because like there's a zipper and just I can throw my wallet in there mm-hmm. and not have to worry about. Yeah, it. Yeah, because that suit does not have pockets. No, I had to. Ma- I used a fanny pack for <laughs> my Spider Punk Daft Punk costume. That was Excellent. pretty. I saw that. Excellent. Spider Daft Punk. Spider Daft Punk. If you I don't, will. I, uh, no, uh, uh, well, no. Daft Punk. Punk Daft Punk, Punk Spider Man. Yeah. yeah, there you go. But then it had uh, speakers in the fanny packs. It was great. Just walk around, listen to Daft Punk all day. People are like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "It's a bit." <laughs> yeah. It's called a mashup. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. So, what do we think? It's my favorite Spider-Man movie. <gasps> you know, it's just it's the most fun. It's the funniest. Um, because that was my big thing. Like, I enjoy the Raimi films, mm-hmm. but yeah. there was always something just a little off. Like, I always thought that 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 version of Peter Parker was a little too morose, mm-hmm. a little cheesy, I, a little cheesy. Well, mm. it's not even the cheese. No. It's the it's the him being like literally crying in every mm. single oh. fucking I can, movie. I can I can I can see that. Yeah. I will always have a soft spot for Sam Raimi just mm. because he's one of my you know uh, one of one of my one of my faves, mm-hmm. uh, but. But I could uh, the the limited knowledge that I have of Spider Man outside of movies, mm-hmm. uh, which is to say mostly the the cartoon show from the nineties. Uh, this felt like the quote unquote like truest to like the classics to to yeah to to proper Spider Man proper that we've seen in the theaters. Um, I still love the Raimi films oh, personally, right. but like but no what what I'm saying Homecoming yeah. Homecoming was like the uh, uh, one of the more accurate mm-hmm. you know least uh stylized for the director or writer team. Yeah. Uh I loved it. I uh, I I went into it with very low expectations. Very mm-hmm. very much the whole like I don't want another fucking Spider-Man movie. I'm so fucking tired of Spider-Man movies. You, you know, can go like, home. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> within, well, within the last twenty years, we've had we've now had three Spider-Man franchises. Yeah, and I'm uh, okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> She's this saying is, it like it's a bad thing. Well, this is this is uh, this is worse uh, in 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 terms of oversaturation. Uh, this is worse, in my opinion, than what happened with like the Batman films mm. in the '80s and '90s. You mm. know, you had the Tim Burton Batman's, then you had the Joel Schumacher Batman's, mm-hmm. which. For all intents and purposes, was two movies mm-hmm. in one franchise, and then two movies in two separate franchises. Because the besides uh, 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 Alfred, mm-hmm. there was very little connective tissue between all four movies. That's true. That's true. Uh, you had you had Alfred in all four movies, and then you had Chris O'Donnell as Robin in two movies. And I want to say Commissioner Gordon was the same. He's in all. Yeah, he's yeah. in all four. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So like. Beyond that, it was almost three separate franchises that you had there. So, like, uh, and 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 we all saw how you know how the the law of diminishing returns really ramped up for that one. So, I basic long winded way of saying I mm-hmm. was not super amped about mm-hmm. Spider Man Homecoming, but mm-hmm. like I do like hanging out with friends. So when you sent out the call that was like, "Hey, who wants to go see this movie?" I was like. I could probably go see a movie at the Alamo. All right. And like I, you know, I enjoy hanging out with people and it doesn't look like it's going to be bad. Mm-hmm. I'm just not excited for it. Yeah. So I sit down and like from moment 1, mm-hmm. like I was like That intro to the vulture. Yeah, I was like Yeah, it was well done. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, also also I was like Jesus Christ, has it been 8 years since the first Avengers movie came out? Mm. No, nah, they just fuck with it cuz the first Avengers movie came out in 2012. I knew it hadn't been eight years. I just fuck with I the didn't... timeline to make it sync with Infinity War better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I uh, I didn't do my research. I was just like, you know what? We have had Avengers and Avengers 2. So, okay, fine. I'll believe it. Mm. Which, that's all that a movie needs to do. Make you believe. Exactly. You know? Mm-hmm. You gotta believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, yeah. So, I I, I liked it. It was right. fun. It, it, uh, as much as I would prefer to have, like, a, a college stage Spider-Man, this was, uh, you know, the the, the Tom Holland is yes. it? Yeah, Tom yeah. Holland, yeah. I think he did a great job. Yeah. Uh I I enjoyed his plucky sidekicks. 
Mm. Uh, mostly, I, I get a chair. Yeah, mostly, mostly guy in a chair, kid. Whatever his name was, Nate, uh, or pff, Ned. Ned. Yeah, he was fun. Uh, and uh, MJ, uh, who we find out at the end. <laughs> you know the show. Yeah, you know the show. Yeah. Spoilers. Yeah. That's again. I, I I haven't said who she is. But yeah, spoilers. Shailene Woodley, yeah. <laughs> Michelle. Mm. Uh, she she was actually probably uh, my favorite. One oh, of my yeah. favorite parts of the movie. Y'all uh, losers. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah no, she yeah. was great. I don't know. I think uh, if you put all the Spider-Man movies together, you'll get the perfect Peter Parker and perfect Spider-Man. Because yeah. the thing that Tobey Maguire does better than any other actor who's played Spider-Man is you feel bad. For his Peter Parker, mm-hmm. his Peter Parker is not uh, an attractive, cool kid. Mm. Every version of Peter Parker that we've had post Tom McGuire, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you feel bad when Tom McGuire misses the bus mm. in the first Spider-Man movie. Mm-hmm. You feel bad when he's getting hit in the face with his backpack in college and he's mm. missing his classes. So Tom McGuire's Peter Parker does that really, really well. Right. Now he's not given the quippy, thrippy lines. You know, you know the only, everyone, the one everyone references. Here's your change from Spider-Man Two. That's mm. like the one. But it's um, all you get. yeah, <laughs> but I will say, and again, you look at Andrew Garfield. I Andrew Garfield's Spider Man mm-hmm. is probably still my favorite Spider Man. Like yeah. his, his, the way he acts, his outfit, Amazing Spider Man Two is still my favorite Spider Man outfit. The whole opening bit from Spider Man Two. Oh, it's the best. Spider-Man it's 2. the best. You know, and 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 just the look of it. Tom Holland, the thing that he brings so well to it is he's a fucking high schooler. Like yeah. it's finally about time. And and people were always like, yeah, but yeah, but we never got that because mm. like the first. Um, I found I sound like really angry for some reason. <laughs> yeah. The first uh, <laughs> you listen here, you stupid fucks. The the um the the all the Spider movies rush to get Peter Parker out of high school. Exactly. And one of the things that I think makes Spider Man so great is he's a you know that that blows people's minds. They forget is he's originally a fifteen year old kid. Yeah, he was the sidekick character. Yeah, in the and he's spotlight. called Spider Man because yeah. you know, and they even make that joke. He's like he's probably thirty in yeah. uh, in, in Spider Homecoming. <laughs> and I like that they actually take their time. He's a sophomore. He's not a senior. He's a yeah. sophomore in high school. You know, Tom Holland brings that kind of innocent charm to it really well. Mm-hmm. He has that the wide eyed, squeaky mm-hmm. voice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. Um, and he brings that kind of uh, the New Yorker thing a lot more to it. I yeah. think this this movie does New York really well. Yeah, exactly. Um, with like hey, as a New Yorker, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like feel, hey, it feels like Queens. Yeah, it's, it's like hey, I'm uh, it's after school. I'm gonna go get a sub sandwich. My favorite local sub shop. Yeah, the shot of him uh, with his mask pulled up eating is great. It's a bodega, yeah, sir. <laughs> Fine. We're talking about how great it did New York. Use the right. Term. And I didn't live there. I don't attest to that. That's not my gimmick. Yeah. But yeah, so <laughs> I think you put them all together and you get kind of that great like everything each of each of the, the actors aspect, has brought yeah. something great to Spider-Man. Now, I'll totally agree with that because I, my theory is always that Toby was always a good 60s Spider-Man. Like mm-hmm. he captures that essence of like campy fun that the 60s have. And then you go to and Andrew Garfield and you get the whole Ultimate or not ultimate, yeah, ultimate Spider Man, yeah, like the modern, yeah. original ultimate yeah. Spider Man. Yeah. yeah, my thing that that is like you know Peter Parker is really supposed to be not the cool kid. He's supposed mm. to be the nerdy, yeah. science guy who, like I said, Tobey Maguire just does that. You feel bad for him really well, and like he's mm. super awkward too. Like, oh yeah, he's talking to Mary Jane. He's like, I cried when you played. So you know, you just he's just he doesn't know how to fit in. He's not yeah. like cool. Like all the other like Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland. It's like. The girls are like, hey, like, you know, again, Liz Allen's like, yeah, let's go to homecoming. And you're like, Liz Allen? Like, that's like, you know, his his biggest crush. Um, You should be just like an internal thought bubble. Like, oh, I think he's cute, but I'm never going to tell him. Yeah. And the thing, the thing, (laughs) also, they have. Also, yeah, they have that's a. That's uh, totally what happens to me. Yeah, <laughs> they also have a Mary fuck kill thing in this, which I thought was like fucking insane. Mary F kill. Well, I wonder what F is. Um, yeah, if they would have dropped the F bomb, <laughs> but uh, the one thing this movie does better than any of the other previous Spider Man movies yeah. is the webs under the arms. Like I, I never thought we'd see that ever. It's, yeah, you know, because it's so it's such like a weird thing. And it's great. I was so glad they did that. Also, yeah. I like the Steve Ditko eyes, the smaller Steve eyes. Steve, Ditko. yeah, exactly, exactly. Of course, me like personally, like for my costumes, I'm always about those big guys. I want to get the well, big, like I said, that pr- the, yeah, look, the, yeah. the look on the screen, the best yeah. look still to me is Amazing Spider-Man Two. Yes, that was awesome. Yeah, hands down. So, but I, 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 I enjoy the hell out of the movie. Yeah, um, I love 
that we get to see like Iron Man and Spider Man on the screen at the same time. Mm. You know, I like the reference to the Scorpion that yeah. it, you know they have Ooh, in there. That bookend, yeah. And real quick, I cannot not talk about this. It references the greatest issue of Spider Man of all time, which is Amazing Spider Man thirty three, mm-hmm. where he has the building fall on top of him. Yep. And he's the water's running. I remember the the, wa- the water's running down. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was like, I wanted to turn to Stan to be like fucking doing Amazing Spider-Man 33? Are you out of... I, you, can you, I can't believe this. And that shot of him, you know, pushing up and getting the inspiration, I thought that's who they were going to sneak in mm-hmm. Uncle Ben voiceover because in the comic, it's Aunt May and Uncle Ben exactly, inspiring ghosts, him, yeah. you know, to, to, to lift it. But the idea of him going, I'm Spider-Man, I'm Spider-Man, that was just as good. You know, yeah. him willing himself to pick that up. Exactly. And I, that was my favorite scene in the movie, like that I'm Spider-Man, I'm Spider-Man, and then he pushes it off um, is great. Gotcha. So yeah, I, I think Tom Holland is fantastic as Spider Man. Mm-hmm. Um, like with Chris, I'm always going to have the the Sam Raimi ones. It's like Batman Denied for me. Those are always going to be my favorites, just because um, you know the nostalgia. Which Bruce is Campbell, yeah. yeah, Bruce Campbell, <laughs> yeah. Joel McHale. Okay, well, that's which, right. What's your name, kid? The human spider. The human spider. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bone saw. Bone saw is ready. Oh I got God. you for three minutes. Three, three minutes. whole minutes of playtime. Play oh, that's a lovely outfit. Did your husband make it for you? <laughs> See, that joke wouldn't fly in 2017. Oh, no, yeah. no, that yeah. wouldn't. That wouldn't fly now. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, I'll agree with you. Like, more I, flies with I walked out of this movie like enjoying it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think what you were talking about earlier, too, like, I wasn't as amped as I was with, like, Amazing 1 and 2. Like, I love Sam Raimi stuff. It's classic mm-hmm. stuff. But I don't think I was, like, I don't. I think I want to go back and rewatch them. Because, yeah. like, I really love, I have nostalgia for them. I don't know if I could, like, judge them critically right now. Sure. But I think I want to just because I was, walked out of this movie thinking, that was a good movie. I wasn't really amped. I wasn't really like excited. I want to go see this again, mm-hmm. like like how I was with Amazing One and Two. I would love to see Homecoming again personally, just because mm-hmm. I want to see if it was just low expectation that mm-hmm. first time. Mm-hmm. There, yeah, that could be I, a uh, thing. Ken, Ken, and I were talking real just real quick earlier about like I'm very much the minority that I love the Amazing Spider Man yeah. Two, um, and I think. That's mostly for like the end scene with the kid. I think is one oh. of the best Spider-Man oh, scenes yeah. of all time. Oh. Also, it, it pays Paul off. Giamatti, Rhino. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah not, not not so much, but like it pays <laughs> off earlier because that kid gets bullied and they break his like wind turbine or whatever. Yeah, and Spider-Man's like, "Did you make this?" And he's like, "Yeah." He's, awesome. like, he's like, "No, you didn't. This is a fucking wind turbine, you little fuck." <laughs> no, but That's he, you know, and what he, he says. and he, you know, he whips it together and he walks him home. Yeah, and so that pays off really well. Yeah, there's there's problems with Amazing Spider-Man too. There's too many elements going on. Yeah, but I thought that oh, Garfield really. Well, they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They I'm were, glad they cut out a majority. I'm glad really, they cut out the original ending. Yeah. They were really trying to set up this uh, extended universe Which, with uh, with the mm-hmm. villains and stuff like that. There, the, what, and it is with Death of Stacy, Gwen Stacy, which they're still trying to do set up like this whole universe. Like, have you been reading? the bits about the Venom movie that's Yeah, but out. then Kevin Feige was like, that's not gonna, like, it's not gonna connect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just calm down, calm down. Like, it was basically Amy Pascal basically being in it, asked at, like, a press junket, like, oh, I totally think it could be part of it, and you can almost see Kevin... They're best friends! <laughs> yeah, you can see, like, Kevin Feige, like, next to her, just kind of being like, I've made... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just that, that arrested development, yeah. I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I, I, you know, if the, will we see Venom and Silver Sable link up with with uh, Spider Man down the line? Maybe, but maybe. I don't think I think Marvel Studios is going to be like maybe. It'd be uh, stupid if they didn't. Yeah. Let's let's be honest, and and they will. I, how why they wouldn't is would be it's, it's stupid. I just want them, <laughs> but I want them to go like develop don't rush this. It. Yeah, don't write it. it. Like all these like leaks, like oh they're planning about this. Like I want do a script, get cast, like. Mm-hmm flesh out this movie we've already had enough of like oh they're gonna do a like a symbiote or, or they're doing like a sinister six thing i've already had that you know thrill and rush from after amazing Two. just let's calm down you've already been hurt too many times i know <laughs> <laughs> over and over i'm bleeding in the chest mm. <laughs> yeah. so so no yeah. i think we dug it you know uh, across the board yeah. um you know if you've been burned too many times by spider-man fear not Fear not, true believer. Don't worry. <laughs> Excelsior. If, if Dunkirk and War for the Planet of the Apes and Valer- Valerian City of a Thousand Planets is sold out, there will always be Spider-Man Homecoming. You can get your you can get your Spider-Man fix if you can't get your X Green Goblin fix. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you should yeah. watch Spider-Man Homecoming over any of those uh, over Valerian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'm interested. It looks pretty. Oh, maybe on five dollar day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe. I mean, you know, it's 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 by. Um, it's got Rihanna. 
It's by mm-hmm. it, uh, it's um, uh, yeah, it's Luke Benson. <laughs> Luke, the song. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. I kept oh, geez. forgetting his name, and then I kept getting interrupted. I was like, I can't remember. <laughs> yes, Luke Besson. <laughs> so yeah, this. Yeah. Been, uh, thanks again to Jay Ferber for yes. coming on and promoting okay. elsewhere again. Out, uh, you know, comic stores everywhere. Wednesday, August second. This has been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Spider Ken. Spider Bob. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bana. Patrick. <laughs> this has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening. <laughs>